they be controlled? From an HSBC perspective, again, you've been a pioneer in driving inclusive growth in different parts of the world. But if I look at the point around MSMEs and the skills required to play in a global supply chain, what are the types of skills required to be relevant, as you said, around health and, and safety and other aspects? But what can individual companies do to help their supply chains be resilient and be relevant in global supply chains? And what do you should global or company or industry bodies like Sydney do to enable that as well? I think that's been one of the learnings, one of the major learnings from the pandemic has been obviously we need supply chains that will deliver the imports of the raw material, irrespective of weather, irrespective of nature events, or irrespective of the pandemic or whatever. So I think very clearly, I think most large companies have re looked at where their source material is from and whether it is good to just have one nut in a car come from Venezuela and then you know that manufacturer has a problem and therefore you can't deliver the car to your. Uh, and buyers or something like that. So I think for a firm like HSBC, see our job is essentially because we are possibly the most global financial institution in the world, our job really is to make sure that what the big customers everywhere in the world want, we take that message into by sector, by geography, by industry, into the, the MSME sector and just do highlight that if you want to be part of the supply chain for the world's largest manufacturer of smartphones to, to luxury cars to whatever, these are the must-dos, these are the minimum, this is how you finance yourself, this is how you tie up the documentation, etc. So I think one is global best practices and we do do a quite a bit of that and we do, do see the benefits we think that the customers are, are deriving from there. I think that is one part from a resilience perspective. I think secondly, I think very clearly is, I think there is there has been a tendency to sort of keep it very, very tight in India in terms of, you know, not not keep any buffer either on inventory or on working capital or things like that. That's the other thing we do share that I think if you're going to be part of a very large supply chain, people will want to make sure that you adhere to timelines and you're not running out of money or something. And third is of course technology. Uh, being the world's largest trade bank, we are able to offer technology and tools which help the customers manage their own inventory cycles and cash flow. In the context of what you talked about, that we are our warehousing capacity is less than the 25th city in the US. What are the types of ways in which major investors, developers, companies like yourself, what changes do you need to make in your own platforms to be relevant to companies who want to put more in warehousing or supply in India? Yeah. You know, it, it actually links very well to your point about inclusive growth. So we talk about urbanization story in the country and at the same time we talk about the impact on air quality, availability of water, quality of water, etc. I think a lot has been said about urbanization. Uh, we are going to add the size of continents to our urban population in the next decade or so. I think it's time that we start thinking about suburbanization of India uh, because how do we how how do we place the next 100 or 200 million uh, population that will move to cities or uh, kids who will graduate uh, colleges. So India needs to go suburban, India needs to develop suburbs, whether it's clusters of excellence, whether it's clusters of innovation, clusters of manufacturing. Uh, land reforms is a big, is a, is, it should be a big focus area for the government. Uh, we have gone back and forth a little bit on that. Uh, national monetization plan, uh, pipeline does talk about uh, talk about uh, judicious use of land assets sitting with the, with, with the government and various companies in the government. But I think a combination of thinking differently about our urbanization is the key to unlocking some of the growth. Uh, uh, because there is innovation happening across the world. You know, warehousing, for example. India is a country which has several times population of many developed economies and a fraction of the land. We need to develop vertical warehousing, for example so that we can, uh, we, we, can, we can deliver the same amount of throughput in less land that's required. And uh, you know, already we just talked about advancement in technology. Uh, the, the, the world is developing six to ten solar warehouses right now. And there is no reason why with the amount of engineering talent that we have, we cannot develop this. Uh, but to be able to free up uh, the load of our cities and being able to create infrastructure to, to develop several such suburban uh, suburban centers of growth uh, will be a key. And I think there is, there is 
no dearth of global capital uh, towards implementation of that plan available. In fact, there's a lot of domestic capital if it's, if it's channeled appropriately, finds finds home towards these large scale projects. This will, of course, as you develop all of this infrastructure, uh, developers, it's a massive opportunity to send forth and other developers. In your mind, what are two or three things that you would like to see that would accelerate action on the ground? Again, there's been a lot of announcements on hydrogen, lots of, you know, pilots that have been announced, but not yet perhaps on the ground. So what do you expect either from companies or the government to actually enable more and accelerate that? Well, I, I, I'd say at two ends of the policy spectrum. One is uh, at the high level and then one is really at the, at the ground execution level. Uh, at, at the overall uh, policy level, uh, I just want to reiterate what I said earlier, that uh, the, the strategy of ensuring sufficient demand, keep, keep the demand growing, and nothing beats the entrepreneurialism and the initiative that Indian industry will take to fill that in. And particularly in, in relatively more regulated industries. You know, if you look at what's, what's happened in the power sector uh, in the last about four or five months, a sea change has happened. When the senior most political leadership of the country brought 30 chief ministers together and said, you have to pay your power bills. We are not going to uh, tolerate any more laxity on this. Followed up by clear policy, things changed. Today, you may be shocked to know, I would say more than 85 to 90 percent discounts are paying dead on time. I never thought I would see this in my life. So I think one is maintain that clarity of the high level policy, make sure there's enough at least demand. I think on the, on the, uh, at the ground level, uh, there's a lot going on already in terms of, uh, you know, sorting out land availability, sorting out uh, taxation, sorting out, uh, you know, GST, ironing out various things, etc., etc. I would just say one thing that, uh, you know, just as we, just as, uh, as a country, we have some excellent platforms to bring in new investment. At the highest level, things get monitored and debottled. We also have an excellent platform for consumer or citizen grievances, where you can literally put anything up on the on the on the portal and it gets resolved. I think something of that equivalence or that priority or visibility for to solve existing company issues that come. Up. Today, our, our uh, um, standard open process is go to the relevant ministries, and there's, there's a lot of responsiveness from most ministries today. But at the end of the day, there will always be some 15-20% issues that get that go into a loop, which which just uh, carries on for years and years and years. So I think some national, at the highest level, portal or platform or something that can we, where you can go for existing business issues and they get the same level of uh, attention, speed, and clarity on resolution that the existing other countries. Thank you, Vipul. And I think that will also help the inclusive growth aspect because then small companies will have the same ability to make their points known as bigger companies that might have the resources. We have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions uh, from the audience. So, yes, please. Please put your hand up and you can have a mic up. And then the lady after that. Uh, good morning. My name is Ashok and I'm an entrepreneur and also an innovator. Uh, regarding the credits to SMEs, which was a major question you began with, uh, I want to give a suggestion rather than a question. The credits or the money is actually disappearing in the hands of SMEs and why? It's not really the fault of SMEs, it's the fault of the buyers. And unfortunately, certain laws support that disappearance. For example, IPC Act 
there are dangerous sitting here. IBC Act 2016 is so heavily lopsided in the favor of banks that OCs or the operational creditors don't get almost anything when the companies go insolvent. So this is something probably uh, uh, you guys can't do much about it, but this is something the government has to do something for. It has to be treated, and then the problem will be sorted out. Maybe then the, the uh, fruitfulness of SME funding can enhance. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to request questions. Yes, please go. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for a very nice discussion. Especially like what Anisha said about changing the mindset, which I think is important in practically every sector of India. And my question is to Uncle Gupta, because you mentioned that uh, 12 million uh, graduates uh, India has every year, which in my opinion is actually quite meager for such a large population, which is largely uh, in the younger sector. Uh, what is your opinion as to the quality of education geared towards the industry, or do we need to do modifications there? Of course, the numbers of graduates should be increased, or should it be a uh, non formal kind of education? What is it that should be geared for the industry? That's my question. Uh, I think to get great education in India, I'm not an uh, expert in education, I think make, a, may make an attempt. I don't disagree that uh, these numbers are still comparatively low. Uh, to the potential and the and the demographic trend that we have, it's a fantastic asset that India has. That we are a very young, uh, developed economy. I would I would sort of kind of caution and say India is a developed economy. So it's largely the world can't be called developing anymore. Uh, so the question really is, uh, is for us to talk about delivery of education and employability post education. So we see uh, rapidly climbing student debt in many developed economies, that's a function of uh, more college enrollment than the employable graduates coming out of uh, those reputed colleges. Uh, the proliferation of uh, centers of excellence like IITs, like IIMs, regional colleges, uh, national student technology, national law schools, is fantastic. Not many countries in the world will boast of such tremendous educational institutions. But I think the real uh, meat of the uh, question is delivery of primary education to the masses. Uh, India should aim for 100% uh, high school education graduates. Uh, uh, a significant part of those uh, students coming out of high schools should achieve uh, a, a solid college education geared towards employable skills and not just a degree. Uh, so I think a combination of employability, post education, is what we need to think about. But again, it, it, it goes back. Not every uh, Indian can find a home in Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Pune. We need to develop hundreds and hundreds of more uh, suburbs around these clusters uh, for people to have a good quality of life, education, workspaces, as well as a family life as well. Thank you. Another question? Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Hello. Issues part me from my presentation. As a senior citizen and a responsible uh, citizen, is my questions to the Eurodite board, and these are structural ones basically. My first question is that you know uh, we are all talking about different different domains. In the morning session, I think Mr. Paga said that we work in silos. In Delhi, I am at Vajra Bar in Nawabi Gange. So from my own experiences in this sector is what I am sharing with you. We are talking about, you know, the presidency, T20, we are talking about the uh, UN, this thing we just done there before. Now, what are we as, as organizations, what are we doing on the ground? That's question number one. The second question that follows from there is that, are we really looking in terms of a longer agenda, in terms of when we are looking at things like global supply curve, are we ready? Are we ready with the tolling principle? We are not. Most companies don't even know that. I've lived in Singapore and worked in all That's why I'm sharing this. The third part into that, as a TDD, is that when we are looking at right from the first year of financial year 2019 when the GDP virus started, 3.8% of the GDP was contributed by the rural areas. Has we, as an industry, looked at that and 
and then some contributions towards the that side of the market. And I think it's imperative from uh, from an organization like Fiji, if we can take it off like the HDD and Chief Chief Trishu, we can make a very large headway because if we don't tie up the hills with us, like somebody else has already said, the state of the Himalayan state is just the same what it was 75 years back. So there would not be any Doklam or Tuam if we had done something there. I'm talking as a dedicated industry which is responsible towards the nation. Thank you. And I can give you all a copy of the responsible citizen later. Thank you. Anish, would you just give me this response a bit with respect to how can companies be responsible to drive inclusive growth uh, in the way that they describe, enabling small companies, moving into that area? We always believe that purpose is what should be central for every company. And for us, purpose drives profits, and therefore the focus on inclusiveness comes in as a natural act. There are many others in India as well who follow that approach. And if I were to look at India versus the Western world, I think we are much better positioned in that frame as well. So, which is where I don't see as much of an issue with inclusive, inclusion in general. I think it's more around the approach that we can take or that we need to take. It's more about the processes that we have for collaboration. This is where organizations like Wikipedia can play a very important role in enabling that collaboration to happen. I don't see the lack of intent. I think it's the processes that we need to put in place to improve what we have there. Okay. One more question, yes, please. I have been watching this since God of Super, and I'm visiting a project and program management professional. Uh, and my congratulations to you, Alok, and the esteemed panelists for inspiring this session. So my question is around the innovation cluster. Uh, so as uh, India stands at 40th rank out of 132 on Global Innovation Index, so as part of this innovation cluster, do we have an old statement in terms of improving our ranking? First and second, uh, do you see that the gap or the deficiencies in innovation is a cause for bridging or creating the gap between strategy design and implementation? Thank you. Thank you. I think the first thing we should ban is global surveys uh, because it's irrelevant, right? So what we need to do here is relevant for what capabilities are required in this country. We would want to just talk a bit about innovation in the context of clean energy. We touched about it on demand, we touched about it on long term financing. We just spend a minute more on that. Yeah, so let me, let me maybe uh, share one or two quick thoughts on this. I think um, it, it's actually a very good point because if we are to scale up manufacturing, okay, uh, my sense is that there is a speed change requirement in the way we approach these clusters. Some of the building blocks have come into place. So for instance, the, uh, the new rules that allow centers of excellence like the IITs to actually receive CSR funds towards technology development. If you look at some of the, uh, what, if you know, just again continue on the IITs as an example, some of the clusters that they've created or some of the innovation parks that they've created if some of you haven't visited them, I would, I would really encourage you to take some time to visit them because some of these are actually quite, uh, it's quite amazing the skill and ambition uh, of which, of what has been created. Having said that, okay, I think we have uh, a long, long way to go. And, and I'll maybe point uh, towards two or three things that we need to do if we are to achieve this innovation cluster ambition that, that, that we're so bold to sort of put out there. I think number one, the nature of work in, in these clusters needs to get back to uh, more uh, groundbreaking, more uh, ambitious kinds of um, uh, uh, innovations. Today we're doing some excellent work, and I'm talking about energy things. So we're doing some excellent work in, you know, how do you apply uh, global technologies to Indian conditions. That's good, that's necessary, that's excellent. But okay, where is the real innovation in terms of the next solid state battery, the next metal hydride battery, the next 
uh, kinds of intellectualizer etc. Okay, so, so one is the, the, the scope and ambition of what we do. I think the second is structurally uh, the sources of funding for this innovation. We need to think through this at a, at a national level. If you look at some of the success stories, and maybe just take the US or take Japan as, as examples, over the last 50 to 100 years, by far the lion's share of that funding has actually come in from the government. That has allowed corporates to invest, and over time corporates have invested a lot and they've, they've done good work. But I think that uh, today we are in a position where, to be honest, in energy, because we've adopted a very uh, strong tariff reduction approach to getting the energy transition done, to make, make your power cheaper, 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 that doesn't leave too much of uh, uh, investable surplus in the hands of companies to actually go in and say, okay, let me take more than my fair share or more than my necessary share into r &D. So I think the problem is to figure out where the funding is going to come from and tweak if necessary, tweak you know the tariff policy. If necessary, tweak the the amount of surplus we're leaving with the companies to do this. Companies want to innovate. You know, as the manufacturing cluster go, companies will want to have the IP. So this is a couple of concepts. Well, thank you, Bhutan. That actually sets up very nicely for the next session. Let me just close this panel out, obviously by thanking our colleagues with just three or four main points uh, that we want to emphasize. Right. So the India Century Initiative is focused on 600 million jobs. 10 lakh per cent at capita income, 100% clean water availability, and at least double female labor force participation. In order to do that, there are a number of actions, there are actually 110 actions in 10 sectors. There are four cross cutting capabilities that the Spiti and McKinsey partnership will drive one on innovation clusters, the second on scaling up SMEs, the third on driving large scale digital skilling, and the fourth is reforms to ensure the capital markets can achieve what we just discussed on long-term equity and debt to support all of the growth that is out there. I think the discussion today shows that there is a lot of optimism and energy. There are real execution and capability challenges, as Anish also mentioned, mindset challenges, and 